Now, to begin, according to the grammarist, the elephant in the room is a large, obvious, and important thing that no one wants to address because the problem is uncomfortable. The elephant in the room is an American phrase with murky origins. The first reference being in 1935 to mean something obvious and incongruous. In the 1950s, the elephant in the room came to mean what it means today, something enormous that people choose to ignore because it is uncomfortable to deal with. An interesting example of ignoring the elephant in the room occurred in the 1935 Broadway musical Jumbo, in which Jimmy Durante is stopped by a cop while leading a live elephant across the stage. What are you doing with that elephant, the policeman asks. What elephant, answers Jimmy Durante. Perhaps this scene helped to create the idea of ignoring the elephant in the room. OK, now to the actual elephant in the room. Last year, we made sacrifices because we knew we needed to in order to try to keep everyone safe. We closed the doors of our synagogue, even as we found new ways to open up our shul to the community. We made the difficult but important decision to pre-record many of our High Holy Day services, leaning on Cantor's amazing talent, abilities, and dedication to create an immaculate remote worship experience. And then when we continue virtually, knowing that one day speedily and soon, we would be redeemed by the promise of a vaccine. The promise being, once this vaccine was delivered, we would be able to return to life outside the walls of our homes. We patiently signed up. We waited our turns. As an aside, coincidentally, Joy and I ended up receiving the same date for our vaccinations, but at separate locations. Joy was at Good Samaritan, and I was scheduled to receive mine at the County Health Center. One of Joy's co-workers also had the same date and time as I did at the same location, so I like to joke that I met up with her co-worker and we did shots together. <laughs> the promise of this vaccine meant that we would be able to return to restaurants and movie theaters. We would be able to travel again and get together with family and friends, and especially with our grandchildren. We would finally be able to return to the sacred space of our Reformed Temple of Rockland Sanctuary. Early this summer, we began the process of reopening with an eye towards spending the High Holy Days with most of you in person. And then came the Delta variant, concern, fear, and worry that never truly left our midst had returned in full force. But there is another emotion as well, and that is anger, the elephant in the room. Not only are we worried like we were before, but now we are also angry at those whose decisions may or may not have brought us to this day, but we know they have certainly exacerbated the spread of the virus once again. This raises the question of, is it possible to even navigate the meaning of the Yamim Noraim, the High Holy Days, when our souls are so frustrated and upset? And if it is possible, how do we release the anger in order to do the sacred work demanded of us at this time. According to the Babylonian Talmud, there are three types of people the Holy One loves. One who does not get angry, one who does not get drunk, and one who is forgiving. All three are examples of ways our emotions can get the better of us and cause us to lose control. And who here has not lost it at one point or another, especially over the last year and a half. In the words of Rabbi Ruth Abush Magdur, the destructive potential of anger is familiar to all of us. Extremes like road rage to domestic abuse and even the subtler outbursts of anger can cause great damage. The great Sephardic rabbi Moses Maimonides, the Rambam, believed in the power of the intellect over all, suggests that we banish anger to such a degree 
from our lives that even when we chastise others, we only feign anger and operate only from a place of love. But within Judaism, there is also an important place, even an honored place for the evil inclination, the source of bad and difficult behavior, including anger. There is an ancient story in which the rabbis captured and imprisoned the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, with the hope of making the world a better place. After three days, they noticed that the hen stopped laying eggs. They understood that without the evil inclination, the rooster had stopped coming to the hens and the eggs had stopped coming. Faulty though the scientific reasoning of the story might be, hens apparently can lay eggs without roosters. The point holds. To paraphrase another rabbinic piece of wisdom, without the evil inclination, no person would build a house, take a partner, or have children. In other words, the impulse to do evil is somewhat a misnomer. As the Yetzer Hara, if channeled correctly, can be a force for a great deal of good. In the words of Rabbi Yehuda Lev, so does Judaism in fact teach us that we ought to express our anger, that it's better for us to get it out rather than to repress it? Is Judaism pro-anger? Well, not exactly. To illustrate this point, Rabbi Lev borrows from a story about one of the great sages of our tradition, Rabbi Hillel, who was known throughout the time for his patience. As the story goes, there was a man who made a bet he could cause Rabbi Hillel to lose his temper. On the Friday before the start of Shabbat, Rabbi Hillel was in the bath. At that moment, this man came to the rabbi's house and began banging on his door. Rabbi Hillel got out of the bath, dried off, robed and went to see who was calling him. Standing at the door, this man proceeded to ask the rabbi a very silly question. Why, Rebbe, do the Babylonians have round heads? Hillel patiently answered, you have asked a great question because I think they lack skillful midwives. The man went away and Rabbi Hillel returned to his bath. Undeterred, the man came back again and once again interrupted and asked Rabbi Hillel another silly question. Rabbi Hillel patiently answered in and then again returned to his bath. The man returned one more time and the same happened again, except this time the man finally lost his temper. Rabbi Hillel, the man exclaimed, I have lost a fortune on you. Why did you not lose your temper with me? Rabbi Hillel responded, I am grateful to you for providing me with the opportunity to teach. Cultivating patience is so much more important than making money. As Rabbi Leib explained, certainly all human beings experience anger. We could say that our goal is to be like Hillel, possessing great patience. It's important to note that Hillel genuinely was not angry, which is very different from feeling anger but suppressing it, a bad idea. How did Hillel manage to avoid becoming angry? He realized he had the freedom to see the situation in various ways. He could be annoyed at the provocations, which it turned out were intentional provocations, where he could see the positive in the situation. How great it was that here was a man unexpectedly seeking knowledge. So like Hillel, we can choose to refrain our experiences as positively as possible. We can give every person, every person, the benefit of the doubt. Yet, it is so difficult to give others the benefit of the doubt when we have worked so hard and sacrificed so much to only be derailed by the willful selfishness of others, especially by some who seek to lead. We can't all be like Hillel. Thankfully, Judaism does allow the space for anger, especially righteous anger. As we learn from Kiddoshim, the Holiness Code in Leviticus, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your fellow and not bear sin on his or her account. The trick is not to let this sense of righteous anger become all-consuming. Instead, there is space to acknowledge our feelings and to act on them in ways that are productive. This means staying informed. This means wearing masks and getting booster shots, 
when they come available if deemed medically necessary. This means continuing to practice social distancing and act in ways that keep us and our loved ones safe to the best of our abilities. This means being able to pivot at a moment's notice and change our plans based on the latest information, even if it means we have to once again make sacrifices that we were so desperately hoping to no longer have to make. This pandemic will pass, just not as speedily and as soon as we were hoping. When it comes to anger, there is a phrase as murky in origin as elephant in the room. It is often misattributed to Buddha, but is mo most likely much more recent in origin. It is, holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Our anger on this era of Rosh Hashanah, if channeled properly, can most certainly be for the good. But if we focus on it and let it consume us, the only people we are truly damaging are ourselves, not those we are angry with. May we find the strength to let go of the anger and frustration many of us are feeling and instead be able to focus on the sacred, the holy, and the good. It may not cause a pandemic to leave our midst speedily and soon, but it will help our souls to be able to find a sense of respite and relief. For these are traumatic times. And the best way to work through trauma is to tell our stories and to accept our emotions. Fear and anger are ultimately toxic both to the body and the soul. It is incumbent upon us to find healthy ways to engage with our emotions and ultimately to be able to release them in a healthy way. To conclude, I would like to borrow with a Zen teaching. Two traveling monks reached a town where there was a young woman waiting to step out of her sedan chair. The rains had made deep puddles and she couldn't step across without spoiling her silken robes. She stood there looking very cross and impatient. She was scolding her attendants. They had nowhere to place the packages they held for her, so they couldn't help her across the puddle. The younger monk noticed the woman, said nothing, and walked by. The older monk quickly picked her up and put her on his back, transported her across the water, and put her down on the other side. She didn't thank the older monk. She just shoved him out of the way and departed. As they continued on their way, the young monk was brooding and preoccupied. After several hours, unable to hold his silence, he spoke out, that woman back there was very selfish and rude, but you picked her up on your back and carried her, and she didn't even thank you. I set the woman down hours ago, the older monk replied. Why are you still carrying her? Perhaps in the season at this time, that is enough. May we find the strength from within and from the divine to be able to find the patience, the fortitude, and the confidence to live our best authentic selves no matter how others are acting around us. For it ultimately defines our lives as we reflect during the season are the choices we have made and continue to make, not the choices of others. For we've got a lot of work to do and this world is not going to just repair itself. The Shana Tova.